Okay, so this thing on? Yeah, you hear me? All right. Um, wow, nice turnout. Thanks, everybody. My name's Stuart Sheldon. I'm uh, president and founder of Act USA. I also serve as the uh, director of technology for the Southern California Linux Expo. So the network you're on today is either my victory or my failure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, today I'm talking about Linux as a IPv6 dual stack router and firewall. Um, how many people here run a IPv4 firewall? Show of hands. All right. Awesome. Good, because I'm not going to talk about IPv4 firewalls much at all or how to get a Linux router configured to start with. What we're really going to talk about is how to get moved forward into IPv6 on your device, okay? So I'm going to go over some very hmm, boring stuff as quickly as I can. I'm sure most of you already know this, but for the people that haven't had any exposure to IPv6, I want to cover it a little bit. The address format for IPv6 is long and frightening. We've got eight 16-bit hexadecimal groups separated by colons makes for a really, really difficult address to read. They're all set, uh, the total uh, number of bits in the address space is 128. That's two to the 128, there's 340 billion, 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 billion addresses, or enough addresses to replace the grains of sand on all the planets in our solar system. Minimum network size is 64 bits, so we split it in half. This drives people crazy because, it, God, I got all this address space. Why do I want 18 billion billion devices on my LAN? We do that because of auto configuration. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. IPv6 supports unicast addresses, multicast addresses, and anycast addresses. Now, a little bit more. It also supports auto configuration as well as network discovery. So this is kind of cool because a client can actually get and create its own IP address for IPv6. You don't have to run a DHCP server, but you do have to properly advertise the address out on your LAN from your router. It also supports router discovery. What that basically means is if you're running VRRP or some other protocol to have multiple routers on your network, you automatically get that with IPv6. As a matter of fact, with DHCP v6, you do not get normally a gateway from your system automatically set. Now, it also covers duplicate address detection, which is even cooler. How many people here have had somebody come up on the same address on their LAN? Yeah. Isn't that fun to find? <laughs> so. The way it works is it comes up and it randomly chooses an address based on certain rules, and it looks to see if that address is being used by any other device on the network. If it is, it immediately drops the address, creates a new address randomly, and tests that address until it finds one that's not in use. <coughs> IPv6 does not support network broadcast. There's no network broadcast in IPv6 does not support network address translation. How many people are upset about that? <laughs> uh, how, many, how many people have had issues with trying to get services to work that don't do network address translation? <laughs> All right. Um, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. There's a lot of people that have come up in the industry. I've been in this a little while. But a lot of the newer network administrators and operations people really aren't used to the concept of an actual firewall. Uh, network address translation by default can be a firewall, but it is not a firewall by itself. And we should not be relying on our security just on network address translation. Again, I'll mention it does not officially support longer net mass than a slash 64, and that's because of the auto generation of the addresses. Yes, of course, you can do a slash 26, uh, 126 or something along that line so if you have a point-to-point -point interface. How many people here actually deal with point-to-points? Okay, I got a couple out there. Um, it's actually, there's, there's two schools of thought about that. One school of thought is that 
if for whatever reason you end up with some sort of obscure uh, multicast communication between the two routing devices, you're going to end up in trouble because it's not going to see, see it as the same contiguous network. But also they say that you could have basically a ARP storm as a denial service on the, on the interface. Personally, I set all mine to slash 64 and I leave it at that. You guys can study later on what you guys really want to do. It also doesn't support uh, packet fragmentation. So anywhere along the entire layer 3 protocol, we have to be able to move 1,280 bytes. Okay? <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> <laughs> I'll be done in a minute. <laughs> I get no respect. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the addresses. We have some address shortcuts. Um, this is a fully populated IPv6 address. We can remove groups of zeros and replace them with colon colon. So we can shrink this whole address down to this. And we also can remove leading zeros, get rid of that one in front of the D. And this is the actual IPv6 address that you can program into your system. So the address isn't that big. Yeah, yeah, come on. Oh, see it changed, I went past it. Gosh darn it. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so about addresses. We have a new address type called link local addresses in IPv6. They're designed to only communicate on the network. So in other words, a link local address will not go across routers. And a link local address will only talk to or can only be addressed by another device on your LAN. And every IPv6 interface must have one program. Now, uh, most of the systems take care of that for us. It automatically comes up. As a matter of fact, if you do an IF config on a Linux system and look at the address, you always have that FE8 address in there, which is your link local. Okay? That's even if you don't have a global address. Only used on the local LAN, never routed. Uh, multiple interfaces can have the same link local address. So you could have ETH0, ETH1, ETH2, or multiple VLAN uh, interfaces, all utilizing the same local address. Okay? <coughs> that is why whenever we use it, we must also specify the interface that we're going to have that packet go out on to find that link local address. And we do that by adding a percent and the interface name at the end of the link local during our connection process. And now, also, we talked about automatic addresses. Anybody here familiar with EUI 64? You guys know what that is? I got one person here, and I, and I know him. He's, uh, he works for one of my uplinks. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, basically, that's the act of being able to take a standard MAC address or, um, uh, or excuse me, a standard MAC address and convert it into an IPv6 address. This is done by taking the network address, which would be the first 64 bits of the address, taking the first 12 bits of the MAC address, adding an FFFE in the middle, and the last 12 bits of the MAC address. And then just to make it more difficult, <laughs> we have to invert the seventh bit of the host portion of the MAC address. What that basically means is if your MAC address, let's see, I thought I had it here. Okay, no. And then uh, invert it. So, to spec uh, I'm missing a section of the slide, but that's all right. I'll try to wing it. What basically happens with this is it allows the system to automatically define its link local address and get a starting point for what it may be able to use as its global address. Now, how many people have 
tried to set up IPv6. Okay. How many people, the first thing they do is, I want to know if I can do IPv6. You jump right to the browser, you type in the MAC address, or type in the uh, IPv6 address, and hit enter, and it blows up. Doesn't do anything. That's because the address has colons in it. And what does a colon mean in a HTTP address? Port address. Port address. So the way we get around that is we put the address in square brackets. And that's when I think one of the questions on the cards. So there's a freebie for you. Now, here's some of the address, uh, the address groups. You've got link local unicast. It's always going to be on the FE80 uh, slash 10 network. Global unicast, this is the stuff that gets routed on the uh, open internet. That's on the 2000 slash 3 network. Local IPv6 addresses. This is something I don't get. So we don't have network address translation, but we have a classification for local IPv6 addresses. Uh, you, you must you must be involved with Aaron too. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is that you'd never be able to run them on the internet. So, if we're not going to have NAT, why have local addresses? Unless you're government. Anyway, also a very common address is the loopback address, which is one slash one twenty eight, and an IPv four mapped address to IPv six colon colon with four Fs and the standard IPv4 address. How many people have seen this in their Apache logs? Yeah, all right. It drove me crazy the first, all my scripts broke, right? Trying to find when I was searching logs. I, I, God, what's this terrible thing IPv6? Um, you also have your uh, route anycast address. So what the route anycast address is, is the first 64-bit network portion of the address followed by two colons. When you bring up a Linux firewall or a Linux router, it will automatically specify that address on every router on your network. Okay? Anycast addresses basically respond to ARP requests, but they never initiate an ARP request from that device, okay, using that address. So basically what you have is you have a address that you can set as your default route on your network without having to worry about figuring out what the address is. That makes sense to everybody? All right. And then of course everything colon colon slash zero. Now IPv6 has privacy. RFC 4941 is a uh, RFC that basically defines the, ran the ability to randomize client IP addresses so that you can have multiple public IP addresses on an interface and then rotate through those as you're connecting on the internet so they can't trace back what machine it is. Okay? It's part of the privacy specification. It's on by default by uh, on by default in Windows. Where's my boo? <laughs> it's off by default in Linux. Yay. <laughs> and uh, ironically, Windows also uses random addresses for auto configuration as well. It doesn't use the EUI 64. So I used to think, all right, all the systems use that, but apparently Windows decided they weren't going to. And you know, I hate to admit it, that's a pretty good idea. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. All right, well. <laughs> all right, and. IPv6 tunneling. IPv6 tunneling is designed for as transition, uh, where we can take IPv6 traffic and push it down a tunnel on an IPv4 network. How many people have heard of Torito? How many people hate Torito? <laughs> <laughs> really quick, what uh, it's on by default on older Windows systems. Um, it allows for global routing behind NAT, which I think is very bad. Uh, it completely disables your security in most cases. Yes, sir? How much older is that? Uh, XP or older. My understanding is that uh, it was turned off in Vista. At least that's what Google says. And 
If it's on the internet, it must be true, right? <laughs> All right, so six and four tunneling. Six and four tunneling is right now the most popular tunneling um, protocol used for people that are doing exactly what we're going to try to do here, and that is create our own IPv6 firewall. And uh, you would basically connect to a tunnel broker, such as tunnelbroker.net, and uh, thank you, Hurricane Electric, wherever you are. Owen? Owen? <laughs> um, it allows for point-to-point -point tunneling of IPv6 data between network endpoints via IPv4. God, I can't sum it up any better than that. Six to four tunneling. And it's, it's a network tunneling protocol that was really designed for ISPs and enterprises to create a router that would allow IPv6 only clients to attach and create tunnels with other IPv6 uh, 624 tunnel uh, systems in order to trans transfer their data without permanent tunnels. It's got really limited adoption because you basically are relying on a bunch of ISPs to do something at the same time. I've never seen that happen. <laughs> so. Uh, we won't talk much about that at all. Anyway, all right, so how do we configure the clients? We uh, have DHCP v6 and we have auto configuration. Um, we can talk about the pros on DHCP 6, address tracking. You can track a MAC address to the address that's, that it's given by the DHCP server. Fixed address assignment, just like we have with IPv4. We can assign an address to the device based on its MAC address. DNS server assignment is a lot easier with DH, uh, uh, DHCPv6. And uh, it's a lot easier to push down dynamic uh, PTR and quad A records when you're running a DHCPv6 server. The cons are that it's complicated to implement. It's also the client compatibility is mixed at best. And what I mean by that is uh, how many people are on Macs? in here. Okay. DHCP v6 works awesome on a Macintosh if you turn it on for your interface. Goes out, it'll get an IPv6 DNS server, it'll get a uh, fully uh, advertised address from the DHCP server and works great. I run Debian, I have to do modifications and all sorts of other stuff to get it to work in Debian. It's not terrible, but I don't really need to do it. The reason I don't need to do it is I've got auto configuration. The pros to auto configuration is setup is much less complicated. Almost all clients support it out of the box. Less system overhead. The cons are that you can't attract the addresses based on the MAC address. So um, unless you're saying up for an enterprise and are really concerned about that, uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Also we have limited ability to do DHCP. Uh, or excuse me, DNS server pushdown. There are protocols available to do it, however, and it's also included in the auto configuration specification under another RFC. But you have to run daemon software on the client to be able to accept that, okay? Now, how many people here think you need a IPv6 addressed DNS server to do IPv6 connections? Anybody here think that? Well, sorry. <laughs> You're wrong. Uh, if you wish, it will return both the quad A, which is the IPv6 record, and the A record, which is IPv4. <laughs> so, in essence, if you're running dual stack, and I don't know anybody in this room that would implement without that, um, all you really need is your IPv4 name servers. So, if I was to do DHC, uh, DHCP version 6, I would need to uh, have the, uh, there, I have a couple different choices. I have the ISC DHCP server and the client, or wide DHCP server and client. Uh, in all the implementations that I've used, and as a matter of fact, we're running a IPv6 DNA, uh, DHCP server on the network here today, uh, I use the ISC uh, DHCP server. Now, um, it's important to note this. If you're running a DNS server, it doesn't matter, or a DHCP server, it doesn't matter. Sorry, I hate acronyms. Um, because you have to run a completely separate daemon for an IPv6 
DHCP server. Completely separate program. So you're increasing overhead. Just another reason to do auto configuration. For auto configuration, you have to run some sort of daemon on your router. Anybody here use Quagga? All right. Uh, got one person out there. I happen to like Quagga because we were kind of a corporate level ISP and I do a DGP and stuff with Linux routers, so works awesome and it also emulates uh, Cisco commands, so it's fairly easy to transition into. <coughs> we also have the router advertisement daemon. Uh, this does the same thing, although it doesn't have the routing protocols. It strictly is for auto configuration. And we have the RDNS SD client, and that's a client you have to run on the from Tunnel Broker routing a slash 64 that Tunnel Broker is routing into our router with. We're going to use auto configuration and we're going to use Quagga to advertise the addresses. And we're going to do our firewall supplied by IPv tables and IP6 tables. It was IP tables, not IPv tables. It's been a long day. That's even better. Okay, hardware. I use regular PC hardware. I happen to like Supermicro because I think it's priced right and I get good support for Linux from it. You guys are welcome to build this on anything. You can even build it on a tower if you want. All you really need are two interfaces. Um, we have a little box that we use a lot that is uh, just strictly designed to do purposeful things like routers and firewalls. But any of these will work. How many people have created Tunnel at Tunnel Broker? All right. So this screen should look familiar to you. You're going to go in, create your tunnel. It hopefully will come up automatically with your endpoint. It allows you to select the endpoint that you want to connect on their side. You're going to create the tunnel. Bada bing, bada boom. You now have your tunnel. You have your endpoint IP address as well as their endpoint IP address. You have their endpoint IPv6 address and your endpoint IPv6 address. Uh, they offer you Anycast DNS uh, servers if you want to go ahead and point towards their servers. Most of the time, I think you're probably running your own DNS server, caching servers, you're running a Linux firewall, maybe not. <coughs> if, for whatever reason, you're running your ISP's DNS servers and they do not support IPv6 lookups, you can use these. Um, it also gives me a slash 64. I don't even have to ask them for it anymore. It automatically gives me that that I can run on my network. And if I click under example configs, it's going to tell me what I just need to cut and paste into the command line to bring up that tunnel. Do we have any questions so far? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry? Nobody? Okay. All right. So, we're, uh, we can do this to test everything, but eventually we're going to want to make it so we can auto boot the system, have it come up with a tunnel and everything else automatically. So this is what we're going to modify on our firewall. We're going to add the IPv6 tunnel to our Etsy networks interfaces file. We're going to add the IPv6 routed network to our interface file on our inside interface. We're going to change <coughs> our IPv6 routing setting in our uh, sysctl or uh, sysctl.com file. We're going to install, if we don't already have it on, and configure the Quagga daemon for auto configuration. And I'm going to show you how to change the uh, VT, uh, VTYSH pager so you don't have to hit the space bar every time you go in to make configuration changes. <coughs> so hopefully everybody here is familiar with this file. And what we're going to be doing, we've got our outside interface, or ETH0. Here's our inside interface with our reserved IP address that we're running network address translation on right now. We're going to add IPv6 as an INET6 static address, and that's the one that we got from Tunnel Broker for our endpoint, or excuse me, for our network. I can try. Is that better? All right. Yay! Okay. 
We're having some fun now. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and add the IP address or the IPv6 address stack to our internal interface that uh, this is gonna be our router address for our internal, ne uh, internal IPv6 network. And uh, we're gonna just set the net match to 64. And we're gonna create a six in four tunnel adapter. And this is all, oh, and by the way, I, I promise these slides will be up, okay? So you'll be able to steal this. Um, Oh, excuse me, use this. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Patent pending. No, anyway, so uh, Microsoft, there we go. Uh, anyway, getting back to where I was. Uh, this, this particular um, uh, setup, I've also added the up command down here to set the default route to go out this tunnel. Okay, we have any questions so far? Yes, sir. Yes, that's correct. And that's a really good question. What size shirt do you wear? <laughs> what size shirt do you wear? Large. You wear a large? Yeah. Give me a shirt. <laughs> Here, all the way in the back. Keep going. There we go. Yay. All right. <laughs> And the hand, okay. So now we're gonna go into our Etsy uh, sysctl.com file, and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna uncomment the uh, net.ipv6.conf.all.forwarding equals one. Yeah, I know, cool, huh? <laughs> All right, once we've done that, if we haven't already installed Quagga, we can do an app get install Quagga. That's all it takes, okay? Once we've done that, we're going to uh, touch the Etsy Quagga zebra.conf file, and we're going to change the ownership to the Quagga user for that file. And we're going to echo this export command for the VTY sh underscore pager equals more, because everybody here probably runs less, right? Yeah, because I misspelled it. Thank you. Give the man a shirt. <laughs> All right. Then once we get this exported, and I'll fix it before I put them up. Um, zebra as in a zebra. <laughs> nice try though now. <laughs> but keep thinking. <laughs> Um, a little bit of history, as a matter of fact, I'll give you a little bit of history real quick. Quagga used to be called Zebra, okay? And I'm not really sure why the name got changed. Maybe Africa had patented the word Zebra, I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> boo, all right. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're just going to echo this into our Etsy bash, uh, dot bash RC, <clears throat> and this changes the pager for the VTYSH interface, which is kind of like a shell interface for uh, Quagga. To more so you don't have to it doesn't have the end every time you type anything in okay it'll act actually like a pager then we're going to go in and we're going to edit how many people here use VI oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh no 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 all right <laughs> how many people use nano uh, all right how many people use Edlin <laughs> How many people remember Edlin? <laughs> I, I, had, I had a guy tell me one time that he wrote his senior thesis with Edlin. <laughs> I hired him on the spot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> fired him two days later, he was a liar. So <laughs> anyway, all right, so we're going to edit this file. It's called Etsy Quagga Demons, and this is specific to Debian, okay? We're going to change zebra equals no, we're going to change it to yes, okay? And also, you know, if you guys want to play with BGP, you guys want to play with OSPF, both uh, uh, IPv4, IPv6, and learn a little bit about routing protocols, this is the tool to do it with. Once we do that, we're going to reboot the machine. When we reboot the machine, we're going to log back in, and at the, after we log in, we're going to type in the command VTYSH and it's going to give us a new command. We're going to type config terminal. 
Does any of this look familiar to anybody here? <laughs> Absolutely. It's it's it, yes. It's just control dash P. Wait, yeah, you could. The reason that I the reason that I uh, have uh, have you reboot is so you log back in, so you get the uh, export that we did for the. Yeah, I mean, yes, you can do it without rebooting. I I always get people that ask me that. Dude, it's a router. Get over it. <laughs> what size shirt you wear? Yeah, my shirt. But you like pink? <laughs> <laughs> he can give it. He can. He can. <laughs> okay. Where was I? Anyway, we're going to type in interface ETH1 and we're going to turn off the suppression of the router advertisement on that interface. Okay. So by doing that, it's going to start saying, I'm a router. I'm a router. Come send me your packets, IPv6. And we're going to add our network discovery prefix, and this is the internal slash 64 that we got from Tunnel Broker. And we're going to exit and write and exit. Gee, I seem to remember a company using this interface, but I can't, I can't put my finger on it. Anyway. <laughs> Warning. You now have a fully functional IPv6 gateway, and there is no firewall. You need all the devices on the network when they go and get their address now are wide open on the internet. So what do you think we should do now? Think we should do a firewall? You think? Uh, all right. <laughs> so this is like my simple, simple, simple IPv4 firewall. What's that? Can't see where, where are you looking? The uh, last line on the first line. Yeah. I can tell there. <laughs> All right. What size shirt do you wear? <laughs> okay. So. All I'm doing up here, guys, is I'm flushing the current rules, right? Because I'm going to reload the whole thing. I'm deleting any uh, tables that I may have created or along the lines. I just want to start with a clean slate. Um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and uh, accept anything that comes into the local loop adapter because it's only going to get something from the local loop adapter. I am going to accept every ICMP packet that comes in on my network. Oh my God! It's a router, get over it. We use ICMP to communicate with other routers, whether we like it or not. We can do adjustments on what packets we accept, but at the end of the day, it needs to be available for people to run tests as well, okay? And you know what? If you really want to block it, be my guest, but I truly recommend you keep ICMP for your router open. Why not? Now, this is on my input chain, so this is only for my router. Now, but you are right. You can see I got this forward rule here, but we're also, we're a network management company. I do a lot of diagnostic. So the bottom line is this. If I tell somebody, hey, I need you to ping my desktop, and we do use real addresses on our desktops because we do a lot of uh, kind of strange stuff, but <coughs> I want them to be able to ping it. And in today's bandwidth, with today's gateways, and especially if you run a Linux gateway, it's going to be pretty hard for them to ping a desk yet. Now, if you run a Windows server, I guess you should protect that. I, <laughs> but, you know, we don't run Windows on our network. So, anyway. Yeah, so my recommendation is run ICMP. We could argue about it all day, but I, I don't want to do that either. Um, right here, I've got an interesting rule. I'm allowing protocol 41, which is the 6 and 4 tunnel from Tunnel Broker. So I want to accept that inbound on my outside interface, which is E0. And then, of course, everything, I trust everything on the inside of my network. How many people trust everything on the inside going out of their network? 
Yeah, like I said, it's a sim <laughs> It's a really simple firewall. <laughs> okay. We're, I, I, you know, we could go through all sorts of stuff, but I want to want to make sure that you have something to go with here. Now, simple enough. I'm going to allow input of only established and related packets in my external interface, and I'm going to drop everything else. Here, here's my post routing. I have a static IP, so I don't need to use Masquerade. I'm going to do a SNAP to my source on the outside for everything that goes out my E0 interface. And now at the bottom, I'm going to forward everything that ETH1 or my internal interface wants to forward out to the internet. Like I said, simple firewall. You guys can go chase your protocols later. <coughs> and I'm going to allow anything that's established and related back in. And I'm going to drop everything else. Any questions about this? Remembering I already explained the ICMP. <laughs> All right, great. So what are we going to add? Well. For our IPv6, we're going to have to clear the same rules. Only difference is, look at the table that's missing. We have no NAT table. Okay? Yay! Yay! <laughs> All right. Ah. <laughs> Yay! I love it. You know what it is? It's got my finger over the little button there. What's that? Another typo? <sighs> right. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it is probably a typo. Oh my God. Yeah, manage. Manage. All right. Who did it? Who said it? At what? At what size shirt? Medium. All right, we have large and extra large. You want large? All right. Okay. So, yes, it's mango. All right? Okay. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. Now, <laughs> let's go ahead now and take a look at our loop back. We're going to do the same thing with IPv6. But we're going to specify each and every interface that runs IPv6. What's, what interface is conspicuously missing here? No, don't look. You may find another typo. I'll just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the interface that's conspicuously missing is ETH0 because we aren't going to get any IPv6 traffic on ETH0. We're only going to get it in our tunnel that exists on ETH0. Okay? Now, the reason that we do this for every single interface is, remember I told you about uh, the IPv, um, uh, oh, the link local address, and how you have to tell it what interface to go out on or it won't make a connection? Same thing holds standard for this. Okay? All right, now <coughs> we have the IPv6 uh, input rules. Here's the four. On the six, pretty much the same thing, except I've added these two rules right here for two multicast packets, okay, two multi, uh, multicast ranges. The reason that I'm doing that is those are router discovery multicast ranges. We need to accept those packets. Remember, we have no broadcast. We only have multicast with IPv6, so it changes the model. I once told somebody that the worst thing about IPv6 is you think it's IPv4 with more address space. Where it really is, it's another protocol that's a lot like IPv4, but if you make the assumption, you'll end up hitting your toe with a hammer. All right, so, and we're going to also down here allow input that is related from our external, and everything else we're going to drop. And this is only for our input chain, okay? Then we need to set up our forwarding rules, and this is what we actually had for forwarding on IPv4, and it's pretty much the exact same thing. Of course, the only difference is the interface. Oh, and gosh. 
let's say I wanted to run some services, I had a web server or something. If I was running IPv4, I'd be doing pre-routing commands to push it back on port 8, back to my local uh, reserved address, and then I, I want to allow back in from this standpoint. On IPv6, what do I got to do? I got to permit the ports in. That's it. Nothing more. No worries about network address translation. We're good. You, it, you are. Oh, on IPv4? I can do that. This is coming from an ISP that fights about giving <laughs> static addresses, people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> Anybody got questions? Yes, sir. From the router, yes, uh, but let's let's say that we're uh, we get a phone call from uh, some pornographic magazine store saying that somebody on your network ordered four thousand dollars worth of pornographic magazines, and you're a business and that's against the rules. Um, you're probably going to want to know at the time that order took place who had that IP address. That answer your question. That's a good question. What size shirt you wear? Yes. Can you say it a little bit louder so everybody can hear? Access control list. Yes. Uh, Quagga supports pretty much all the commands that you're used to in Cisco for ACLs routing the whole nine yards. I could have put the route, uh, the default route in Quagga, okay, if I wanted to. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What do you think about IPv6 uh, prefix translation? IPv6 what? Prefix translation? <coughs> well, it's kind of did now, but... <laughs> and, uh, I hate the idea of my internal addresses being compromised, too. Well, to so with IPv6, and look, um, I, I come from an ISP background. So you can, you can get your own address space. All you got to do is pay Aaron <laughs> if it's that important to you. I, and I don't argue the point. And actually, I believe in the 3.6 kernel. I only read it one place, and I didn't read it anywhere else. So, but if it's on the Internet. It's got to be true. Um, there is code that is being incorporated in the kernel to do one-to-one -one NAT, which is along the same lines of transitioning the prefix. Okay? So th there's still chance out there. I mean, let's be honest. I hate NAT, okay? But in the world... We have NAT, and there's a lot of people that want NAT, and there's a lot of people that have concerns the same way you do. And the industry drives, the consumer drives what the industry does, right? So just yell real loud at your vendor, <laughs> all right? All right, I saw another question back there. Oh, my God. <laughs> Owen, how are you? Good. Going back to your uh, permit for those multicast addresses. Yes, sir. No, Owen, it doesn't. What shirt size do you wear, <laughs> Owen? <laughs> you an extra large over there? <laughs> Give him a shirt. <laughs> and, Owen, the shirt's going to cost you you telling everybody what range they need to permit. Okay. But wait. I permitted the whole network. No, slash, uh, yeah, slash 16. I want the shirt, no. <laughs> More questions? Yes, sir.
excellent question. Okay. Um, yes, it's all the same with the exception that routers are allowed to advertise that they are a router. So you, um, like, well, <laughs> no, because network time can be a broadcast as well. So no, it's a multicast uh, conversation between the client and the router. And it's a, I get calls all the time when somebody has multiple routers the first time they set this up. They go, I've got five default routes. <laughs> well, yeah, you do. <laughs> you know? And if one fails, guess what? It's going to ARP out and boom. You're going to be on the other out outbound. So um, for, from my standpoint, you know, I hate VRRP. I know this guy's here that probably love it. Everybody here know what VRRP is, virtual? Uh, okay. Basically, it allows you to have multiple um, routers and a default route IP address that moves on the inside from the different routers based on whether it's talking on the outside or the system's up. So it's for redundancy. Virtual redundant routing protocol. I got that one right, Owen? Oh, okay. Virtual router. Thank you. Right. What's that? Oh, you already had a shirt, didn't you? <laughs> oh, would you like a shirt, David? Hey, you see the guys in the back of the room that got the jerseys on? See them? <laughs> These guys are scale volunteers, okay? How many people know that? Exactly. Exactly. This is a 100% volunteer supported show. Everybody that you see walking around with a staff badge or a jersey or that answers your question is doing it for free. They're doing it for fun. And they're doing it for open source. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what's the next one you're talking about the uh, Tiger Box on the on the old network? Not a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Cisco actually has, I believe, authenticated router advertisement. Um, that's not incorporated into Quagga. Although what keeps them from popping any device up on your network? What keeps them from popping an ARP bomb up on your network? Hopefully you trust the people on your network. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> I love Cisco. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> yes. Huh? Missing shirts. Oh, my God. What's your shirt? Can I what? <laughs> 